All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, this is your lecture for Thursday, March 26th. Uh, today, we're going to start talking a little bit more about the um, structural makeup uh, of the legislative branch, or the structural makeup of Congress. We're going to start uh, in the House of Representatives. We'll move to the Senate later. So um, the structure of the House, for, for our intents uh, in, here in government class, is going to really focus on um, five key individual figures and then and then the some of the committees that work uh, inside inside the House of Representatives. Um, but the the structural layout of the organizational chart really looks like this. The top of the food chain in the in the House of Representatives is the Speaker of the House, uh, and then you have a majority leader, a majority whip, a minority leader, and a minority whip. Uh, that majority and minority piece that is based on uh, whether Democrats or Republicans have more members uh, in the House at the time. So right now, um, Democrats have more members of the House, so they are the majority party. Republicans have fewer members in the House, so they are the minority party. Um, the current House leadership looks like this. Uh, again, the Speaker of the House is a member of the majority party. So currently, uh, it is Nancy Pelosi um, from California. The majority leader is Steny Hoyer from Maryland. Uh, and the majority whip is Jim Clyburn from South Carolina. So that's the majority leadership uh, in the House of Representatives. Um, the minority leadership currently is made up of minority leader Kevin McCarthy from California and minority whip Steve Scalise uh, from Louisiana. Uh, so those are the current people uh, in those leadership positions in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Speaker of the House uh, really has um, quite a bit of power uh, for somebody that is a an elected official on just a two-year term. Um, because this, the House of Representatives has 435 members, uh, the rules, the structure that those 435 members follow uh, kind of are they rest with the speaker. So that person, that position uh, holds a lot of power. Um, one of the duties that they're responsible for is assignment, assigning um, representatives to committees um, and, and assigning bills co to committees. So when somebody uh, in the House of Representatives authors a bill and wants a bill to be voted on, uh, the first place it's going to go is to a committee. Uh, and the speaker of the house is going to be responsible for deciding which committee um, a bill starts in. So a uh, pretty, big, pretty big job for the speaker to do. Um, the speaker is also going to serve as kind of the spokesperson uh, for the House of Representatives. So it's the reason that you see uh, Nancy Pelosi so frequently on television or in the past, somebody like Paul Ryan uh, or John Boehner before him, um, whoever the speaker of the House is typically typically gets quite a bit quite a bit of airtime because they are the spokesperson uh, for that legislative body. And as such, a lot of times they're able to drive the legislative agenda. Um, they're able to make critical decisions or in some in some cases partisan decisions about what bills go where what bills get voted on so on and so forth but um, they are an extremely visible uh, part of the House of Representatives the Speaker of the House is frequently going to serve as the spokesperson between the House of Representatives uh, and Congress on this slide here you can see um, both Republican speakers that President Obama worked with. On the left there, you have John Boehner, and on the right, you have Paul Ryan. Um, but in, in most cases, when the president is looking to debate something, or not necessarily debate, but discuss something with a member of the of the House of Representatives, um, the president has, has historically turned to the speaker to do so. Um, another kind of a side, side note, or a perk, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, is... As the Speaker of the House, you are you are third in line. So, um, if if LBJ had also been shot in Dallas at the same time that President Kennedy was assassinated, uh, you would have ended up with the President John McCormick. McCormick was the Speaker of the House at the time, um, so he that the, that position, Speaker of the House, is is third in line as far as presidential succession is concerned. Um, the majority leader, really, in, for all intents and purposes, is the vice president uh, of, of the House of Representatives, so to speak. Um, the majority leader is, again, the second ranking um, leader of the majority party in the House. And that person is going to take on a pretty critical leadership role inside of their own party. And typically, they're going to work very closely with the Speaker of the House, as you see here with um, Representative McCarthy and Speaker Paul Ryan. Um, they had a, a very close working relationship while Paul Ryan was still the Speaker of the House. The other, the other piece or the other, the other position that I've kind of highlighted as as being critical is the position of whip, uh, whether that's the majority whip or the minority whip. Um, that is a critical role uh, inside each party in, in the House of Representatives, and that person's job really is is to whip votes. And, and what do we mean by whip votes? Well. The, the easiest way to think about it is, is is when a bill is going to be voted on by the by the House of Representatives and 
it's something that is particularly inflammatory or a partisan, maybe an issue like gun control, right? Um, the Republican Party whip, the, in this case, the minority party whip would be Steve Scalise. Uh, he's going to be responsible for making sure that he talks to or addresses um, issues with Republicans before they vote on this bill and make sure that all uh, Republicans or as many Republicans as he can um, are going to vote the way that uh, he uh, and the party leader want want them to vote. So the whip's job is really to, to make sure or to count votes um, and make sure that bills that are being being put up for a vote either um, have the support that they need or that they have enough votes to strike a bill down, right? So uh, if Nancy Pelosi, the current speaker, were to put a bill um, on the House floor, uh, a gun control bill on the House floor, and it was going to severely restrict Second Amendment rights, um, Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader, and Steve Scalise, the minority whip, uh, would work very closely together, but ultimately it would be Steve Scalise, the minority whip, um, responsibility to make sure that they have enough votes um, to to defeat the potential gun control bill. Again, that's not a real bill that's currently being debated. Uh, it's just an example. All right, moving over to the structure of the United States Senate. The U.S. Senate um, is structured a little bit differently, um, and and really the biggest the biggest uh, change is the way that power is organized at the top of the House, at the top of the Senate, I should say. Um, because there's 100 members, because it has unlimited debates, because those those um, senators serve six-year terms, the president of the Senate is is very limited uh, in how much power they actually have. Um, where the Speaker of the House has quite a bit of, of political power, um, the president of the Senate has almost no political power. Um, much like much like the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate uh, is going to be a member of the majority party. Um, so currently, uh, Republicans have have control of the Senate. So the the President of the Senate uh, is the gentleman you see on your left. That is Chuck Grassley, the Senator from Iowa, uh, and his official title is the Pre President Pro Tempore. Pro pro tempore of the Senate. Um, the reason it says president pro temp there underneath his name is because the official president of the Senate is Mike Pence. The vice president serves as the president, so to speak, of the Senate. Um, Mike Pence's only real duty as president of the Senate is to break ties, right? So if there's a bill in the Senate and there's a 50-50 tie, uh, Mike Pence gets the, gets the tiebreaker vote. Um, other than that, Mike Pence has very little authority, very little power, or very little time to spend in the Senate. He really isn't going to be there all that frequently. It's going to be pretty um, pretty rare for him to show up in the Senate, um, and it really won't happen unless he has to break a tie. So in his absence, and that's really what pro tempore is indicating there, in his absence, Chuck Grassley kind of serves as the, the ringleader, so to speak, of the circus that takes place inside the U.S. Senate sometimes. Um, but he's going to kind of make sure that the rules are being followed, procedures are being followed, and, and everybody is kind of doing things the way that they're supposed to do them. But again, outside of it being kind of a symbolic, uh, a symbolic role, that's not really where the power lies in the Senate. Uh, where the power really lies in the Senate are with majority leaders and and majority whips, minority leaders, and minority whips. Uh, the current majority leader of the United States Senate is Mitch McConnell, the senator from Kentucky, uh, and the majority whip is John Cornyn, um, the senator from Texas. The minority leader is Chuck Schumer, a senator from New York, and the minority whip is Dick Durbin, a senator from Illinois. Um, whereas Chuck Grassley's position is largely symbolic, Mitch McConnell really is is the probably the most powerful U.S. Senator currently as the majority leader of the U.S. Senate. The real power uh, in the Senate, and frankly in most of Congress outside of the job of Speaker, um, exists in committees. Congressional committees are going to kind of be where all the action actually happens. Committees do the real work, so to speak. And, and as you can see here, um, there are a whole bunch of different of, of a whole bunch of different committees, and, and particularly uh, the committees that we're going to focus on are called standing committees. Um, sometimes you'll you'll see special committees get uh, put together, um, but typically a special committee is going to be something that is focused on a particular issue or a particular debate or um, something that is kind of a come and go issue. Uh, something like net neutrality, something like uh, natural natural disaster relief. If we get a a particularly bad natural disaster, um, if this uh, coronavirus pandemic lasts longer than anticipated at this point. Uh, it is not entirely out of the, out of the realm of possibility that the Senate would put together a special committee um, on 
um, fighting fighting that pandemic. Um, but but members of standing committees um, are going to be members of Congress that that are serving on individual committees, and typically you are a member of more than just one. Uh, in almost all cases, you are, but they have to be policy experts uh, in that area, right? If you end up on the Senate Budget Committee. Um, and you have no economic sense whatsoever, uh, it's going to be incred incredibly difficult for you to do your job well. Um, similarly, uh, if you are on the House International Relations Committee and you have spent most of your life living in Idaho and never really leaving Idaho uh, and having very little experience in foreign relations or foreign policy, uh, it's going to be it's going to be extremely tough. So um, committees are going to be where the real work gets done, and, and it really gives um, senators an opportunity to become experts in one particular policy area. Your current member of the House of Representatives, uh, Jim Jordan, uh, he's a member of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, inside of that that committee, he is a member of of multiple subcommittees as well. Uh, so inside the House Judiciary Committee, he, committee he is a member of the subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice, and he is a member of the subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet. Um, he is also a member of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, and he is the chairman of a subcommittee in that in that spot, and a, and on another subcommittee. So when we look at these, we look at these this list. We go back and look at this list again, and you see the variety of different committees that that um, are in each of the two houses. Um, in all, almost every case, uh, a congressman is going to be a member of more than one committee. For further explanation um, of committees, I would strongly encourage you to watch this YouTube video. I, I've clipped it, so it really only it should only play about four four minutes worth, um, but it, it does a pretty nice job of explaining co committees in a little bit more detail. Committees are also going to kind of serve as the oversight engine uh, of Congress. They are the ones that are going to call the hearings um, to investigate whether or not the law is being um, adjudicated properly, whether it's being enforced properly. Uh, they're going to question members of the executive branch in some cases. They're going to question um, business business people, uh, corporation heads, stuff, people that they think are manipulating the stock market insider trading those kinds of things any of those kinds of, of any of those kinds of people uh, are are able to be questioned by one of these congressional committees uh, if you want to see what that looks like in action i've posted a couple of different a couple of different videos here for you to look at uh, the first one um, is about the uh, website set up under the Affordable Care Act uh, and you can see Kathleen Sebelius the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services talking uh, to the House Energy and Commerce Committee about that particular issue. Uh, on the next one, um, you can look at a uh, a hearing in which um, Trey Gowdy is questioning Director J former Director James Comey of the FBI uh, about the Hillary Clinton emails, uh, but you can kind of see the work that that, that takes place uh, in these committee hearings, and you can start to see, okay, this is what the role uh, of these congressional committees is. <laughs> Being on the right committee is an incredibly part, important part uh, of being in Congress for a couple of reasons. I already talked a little bit earlier about the need to have expertise on certain policy areas. Uh, that if you're going to be an ag on an agriculture committee, uh, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense for you to have spent your entire life living in New York City. Um, but more, maybe, maybe more importantly for for some congressmen, for some some representatives and senators, uh, is is kind of the public image, right? So uh, if you intend on potentially, you know, maybe trying to be appointed to be the Secretary of State later in your career, well, then it's pr probably pretty important that that you're a member of an international relations committee. Uh, if you intend on running for, for higher office later in your political, re political career, um, then you want to make sure that you're on committees that matter, committees that are, that are prominent, committees that um, seem to be getting a lot of exposure on television and in the press. Um, but a lot of times congressmen uh, will use their committee appointments to kind of further their brand or increase their level of exposure and, and increase their, rec their name recognition and popularity. All right, guys. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to note um, before, before I, I get you out of here. Um, if... If you are you are um, in a regular government, you need to keep listening. If you are not, you can go ahead and tune me out, and 
I'll talk to you later. Um, but if you are in regular government, uh, I've had several questions about test corrections. Uh, test corrections are located in Google Classroom. You should see me doing this now. Um, and really, uh, here's how this is going to work. It's a lockdown browser, Google Form, um, at which I explained yesterday. But the question has been brought up multiple times now. OK, how do I know how many points I can get back? Um, the maximum score is a 96%. So if you got a 94%, I still need you to take all of the questions, okay? No matter what, whether you're getting 10 points back, whether you're getting two points back, whatever, you need to answer all 10 questions. If you have if you have concerns about the way that this is being scored, you are more than welcome to let me know. I'd be more than willing to talk to you about that. If you want to know what your score was, uh, shoot me an email and I will let you know. Um, otherwise, you should see those posted in, in progress book in the next day or so. Um, that's about all I got for you for today. Uh, again, your test corrections are posted in Google Classroom and those will close, those will shut down at 11.59 on Thursday evening. So you got one more day to get those done. Uh, I will talk to you tomorrow. Uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. And I really, really hope um, that some of you got outside to take advantage of the nice weather today. All right, see you soon.